the heart and soul behind every business. Stories. Welcome to Business Story of the Week, hosted by me, Joshua Lori. From setbacks to comebacks, from tragedies to triumphs, we inspire entrepreneurs through conversations that matter. Witness the magic that turns dreams into reality. Whether it's your career, business, or life, your success is always one story away. This is Business Story of the Week. Hi, this is Professor Alec Edmonds, and you're tuning in to Business Story of the Week. Fantastic. And that is the man himself who is going to be sharing us the truth today. And of course, my name is Joshua. I am your host today, every day, in every episode. We ask you a question. And today's question is pretty important because in a world where information is everywhere, how do we separate fact from fiction? Well, Professor Alex Edmonds is the perfect guest to answer that question. Alex Edmonds is a professor of finance at London Business School and a leading expert on the use and misuse of data and evidence. A TED speaker with over 2.8 million views and a former investment banker, he's known for his influential book, Grow the Pine, which was a Financial Times Book of the Year, ladies and gentlemen. And of course, Alex has spoken at the World Economic Forum and testified in the UK Parliament. His latest book, May Contain Lies, explores how to navigate misinformation in today's world. And today, he's going to be uncovering, helping us uncover the truth in all this misinformation. How do we navigate this world today, Alex? Thank you for coming on the show. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks so much for having me, Joshua. Looking forward to our conversation. I love this because, Alex, I always, you know, it's, it's, you know, misinformation, disinformation today, probably the most rampant it's ever been because information has always been there. I always start the show with origin story, though, but, but I would, I'm going to change my angle a little bit my, with my first question. I always ask what the young Alex is like. I always start like that. What was a young guest like, right? But for you, Alex, was a young Alex. Edmonds, always a truth seeker. What would the young Alex say to the Alex of today? I think I always was. I was always questioning things. And this is uh, because of luck due to the school that I went to. So I went to a school built on Montessori principles. And so their view of education was not just rote memorization, just learning and, and remembering something. But they looked at what does the Latin word education mean? It's from a duco to lead out. So rather than telling students and getting them just to remember it, they learn out from you the answer. So they would ask you questions, you're encouraged to challenge and to think about different viewpoints. And so this is, I think, what led me to gravitating towards trying to find the truth and trying to ask questions. And that's what led to the book that I was. Fantastic. And of course, you have now a prolific career in finance and of course as an investment banker alex talk to us about your journey and your path i want to lay the groundwork a little bit before we truly start talking about your milestones in your books um your career as a uh, as a professor in finance uh, in, in you know as an investment banker as well what led you to the world of data and finance so to speak and uh, really What really shaped your journey towards writing those books? So my first job was an investment banker at Morgan Stanley. I worked both in London and New York City, and that's a great job. But when I worked on a company's uh, deals, that would be solving one company's problems at one time. So this is why I wanted to move to becoming a professor, because I thought that the bandwidth of your impact could be greater than one company's problems. If you write a paper, give a TED talk or write a book, that could be read by hundreds, thousands, perhaps millions of, of people. And so what I wanted to do was to write papers and do research and give talks based on data and evidence. Why? Because otherwise it's just people's subjective opinion. With evidence and data, you can provide some substantiation for these claims. Now, the work field that I work in is sustainability, also known as responsible business or ESG. Right. And that is a field in which there is unfortunately quite a lot of sloppy data. And why? Because there's a clear answer that people want to be true. People would love to believe. That sustainability, that sustainability always pays off, mm-hmm. that diverse companies do better, 
that unethical companies always do worse. And so if you present a study which claims that, even if the data is flimsy, people will believe this because of what's known as confirmation bias. You will accept um, something uncritically if you want it to be true. Now, even though I want them to be true myself, as a finance professor, I need to make sure that these claims are not made based on tainted evidence, just like a police officer, no matter how strongly you believe a suspect is guilty, he will not plant tainted evidence. And so when I looked in this topic more generally, I found that unfortunately a lot of claims are made based on weak evidence. And then as I looked into this more deeply, this was not just true in my field of finance, but it is true in many things. Climate change, health advice, science, how to bring up kids. There's a lot of urban myths that people believe based on misinformation. So I wanted to write this book just to explain to the person on the street, the average reader, particularly somebody who might not have a background in statistics, what the pitfalls are, and more importantly, what you can do. Absolutely. You talk a lot about confirmation bias in your TED talk, of course. This was way back May 27, 2017, and so it's, it's a fantastic TED Talk, by the way, for all our audience listeners out there to try to navigate to uh, the title. It literally is What to Trust in a Post-Truth World, a fantastic, fascinating mm -hmm. TED Talk. Alex, of course, your view as a finance professor and as an investment banker, they started, I feel like, of course, it completely different. You said you wanted to create more impact. It felt like you could give more broader impact as a finance professor. How do your views on the balance between purpose and profit change as you became a finance professor and how did those again like you're 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 exploring the truth now and confirmation biases where does the truth come in and all of that because of you know when we're balancing purpose and profit so when I first started the topic of purpose and profit it was around 2006 2007 just as when wow. I was finishing my PhD most people thought that purpose is just a complete waste of time. So it's just a company being fluffy and, and tree huggy. And so in order for me to provide evidence that um, purpose was supportive of profit, people would try to attack the research and be scrutinizing. And this is not because they're bad people. They're absolutely entitled to challenge me. And I'm grateful that they did because it made sure that the research, when it was eventually published, was rigorous and could stand up to scrutiny. So I believe that purpose is something which is consistent with profit. It is not at its expense. But now the pendulum has swung the other way. Yes, Nowadays exactly. in 2024, everybody claims to be purposeful. Purpose is one of the big buzzwords. Mm -hmm. And so what you now have is some very weak papers claiming a link between purpose and profit, okay. even though the evidence is really flimsy. So my views on this, just like my views on most things, are rather moderate. So I believe that purpose is good, but purpose is not the be-all and end-all. There's sometimes right. people who will invest in companies because they've got a great purpose statement, even if they can't do the basic things right. So purpose is an important dimension of a company, but it's not the only dimension. Just like if a new person is elected to the board of directors, what people will look at is, is this person female or an ethnic minority rather than his or her actual credentials? Now, clearly, as an ethnic minority myself, I do believe in the benefits of diversity. But when this becomes the only thing that we look at, as opposed to experience, track record, time commitment, and so on, then I think this becomes rather distracting and misleading. Right. And I feel like that's where the truth starts to blur, right? Because purpose, profit, and I feel like you, you talked about the pendulum swinging towards the profit, but I mean, to, towards purpose away from profit. But why is truth still so ambiguous and, and it, it almost like it, it doesn't matter where the pendulum swings, the truth always seems muddled? This is because of a second bias that I talk about in my book. So you've mentioned, Joshua, um, confirmation bias, but a second bias yes. is black and white thinking. I this love is that. the idea that we like to view the world in black and white terms. It's either all or nothing. So one example outside of purpose in the Atkins diet. So this viewed carbs as completely bad. All carbs are bad, not just refined sugar, but complex carbs as well. Anything with a carb label is bad. And mm. why did that diet catch fire? It was just so easy to implement. You can tweet that in 280 characters or even fewer, and you just have a simple rule to follow, avoid carbs. Now, some ESG rules or urban myths, they also are playing on black and white thinking. Let's say the only thing that we care about in a director is his or her diversity. 
That means you just need to look at the ethnicity and gender. You don't need to bother looking at their credentials, their experience, whether their experience is complementary to the skill set of the existing board. It makes things really easy. Similarly, with the sustainability, we can look at issues in black and white terms. We might say that any company that makes concrete is really bad because concrete production releases a lot of carbon, not realizing that concrete could be used to build hospitals and schools. So the simpler that we see things, the easier it is to implement and put into practice, but the more likely it is to be misleading because the world is not black and white, it is shades of Wow, I love that. It's, it's, it's just so common. It's so prevalent. Like, we just want black and white because it, it confirms our bias, like you said, but I love the black and white bias because it's, what, it's just so much easier to think of the world that way and having this kind of gray area for people to think about it's just it leaves things hanging for people and i feel like people fear that because we just don't want things to be so so unsure so to speak we just want something clear is it black is it white don't tell me anything else alex you now wrote again you wrote a very influential book it's titled Grow the Pie, which was a Financial Times book of the year. Before we start talking about your new book, May Contain Lies, of course, we'd love to now explore that as well. Talk to us a little bit about the inspiration that went behind Grow the Pie, a book of the year, and why do you think it was book of the year? Sure, thank you. So this um, I wrote, it was published in 2020, but I started writing it, I think, around 2017. 2018. And so why did I, I write it? Because I think for far too long, people thought about purpose as being good for wider society, good for the planet, good for people, but not good for business. And so people thought, well, this is something where companies which are pursuing this are, are, are tree huggy, they are worthy, but they're not understanding the importance of generating profit. And so that's a problem because that means that the only way that you can get companies to be more responsible is through regulation. And I do believe in regulation, but regulation can only capture a couple yes. of things. Companies can comply with the regulation, but not actually um, comply with the spirit of it. So I wanted to show that it is in your own interest as a company to embrace sustainability and purpose because it will make your company more successful in the long term. So I wrote this book on the business case for purpose compared to the philosophical or moral or ethical case. And I think this idea that there is this business case as well improved its receptivity because it made people think, well, actually, this is by a finance professor, an ex-investment bank, and this is not by somebody who's trying to guilt trip me or browbeat me into doing purpose, but it's to highlight the benefits of purpose for um, the success of my company. Now, I given that. I am Go important ahead. about committing to the truth, I should just say it was not the book of the year. So the Financial oh. Times has a list of books Erased. of the year. So this was one yeah. of the books of the year, but I, I don't want to, um, the reader to think this was the, the number one book above all the others. So it's still a, a nice accolade to be given, but uh, there were course. other books who got the accolade as well. It's a fantastic accolade out there. You know, I mean, there are, there are many book of the years, but it clearly made a massive impact, a significant enough impact to be acknowledged, gain that, you know, to gain that acknowledgement so to speak why grow the pie real quickly why the title yes yeah, so, so what is the pie why does the finance professor write a book mm -hmm. about pie so we often think that the value that a company creates is given by a pie and we can mm -hmm. split that pie between profits to investors and value to wider society and many people have a fixed pie mindset if you believe the pie is fixed the only way that i can increase profits is by reducing the slice given to wider society And that's why there are companies which pay their workers as little as possible, charge as high prices. But by calling the book Grow the Pie, I'm highlighting that the pie is not fixed. If a company is investing in its workers, it's not donating part of the pie, it's growing the pie, workers become more productive and more motivated, and ultimately profits also. And of course, again, this all ties back to your current book and the current, the, the, we were talking about earlier the pendulum of purpose and profit and truth coming into that and data being misused, which now you talk about your current book, which is titled May Contain Lies. Again, we are on the topic of the misuse of data and evidence and how truth is being muddled today in this world. Alex, talk to us a little bit about that. If data was a recipe 
what would be the most important ingredient to ensure that we don't spoil it so we don't misuse it? If data is a recipe, I think the most important ingredient is integrity. And so what does that mean? Because integrity mm -hmm. means different things to different people. But just to make sure, so integrity means consistent with what it can do. So, it, so, so if something's integral, it is one sort of homogeneous, consistent whole. And so to make sure that we're, we're not um, exaggerating what the data is representing. So one example of an exaggeration could be Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours rule. So he claimed that there was a rule that you need to spend 10,000 hours of practice if you want to be successful in any kind of field, be this chess uh -huh. or neurosurgery. But the data, the evidence that he cited was a study on violinists. So the lack of integrity there was to over-extrapolate from a study which was specific to violinists and claim that this has implications for all of these other fields, which are quite different to violin playing. So what leads to success in violin playing may well not be leading to success in other fields. I love that. And it goes back to the black and white bias, does it not? Because we're thinking like, oh, wow, the, it works with violinists, then it should work for everyone else. So it goes back to that. We, we kind of want to simplify the truth all the time in the process we actually lose the chunk of it we're just basically looking at the tip of the iceberg of what the true information is what the true data is of course you talk about this and may contain lies your latest book that is out right now alex talk to us a little bit about that yes so so what is this book about this is about how we can spot misinformation and then more practically what to do with information mm. now you first might think well the title may contain lies that seems pretty inflammatory because lies is a strong word to call somebody a liar is a rather big step and you might think well if my goal is truth rather than extremism why did i call the book something about lies what i'm trying to highlight here is that lies can be so we often reserve the word lies for a blatant history. However, mm. it could be that something is fully true, but it still is misleading. Why? Because it might be out of context or it might be the exception that proves the rule. For example, Simon Sinek, who's given a very well-viewed TED Talk, he claims that starting with why is the secret mm -hmm. to success. And he says there's a lot of evidence for this. Apple started with why and became successful. The Wright brothers started with why and they were the first to launch a test-powered flight. Wikipedia started with why and has surpassed the Encyclopedia Britannica as the world's founding for knowledge. But even though those things are true facts, Apple, clearly successful, this is still a lie because he's hiding the hundreds of other companies that started with why and be famous. So something which is selective, cherry-picked representation, that is still something which would fall under my definition of a lie, even though what you say is true, it's what you don't say and what you're hiding, which is the lie here. So what I want to do is I want to alert the reader towards the broader definitions of lie. Why? As a practical matter, you might think, if it's a blatant untruth, somebody says something fraudulent, can't the government prosecute? Yeah, and they probably could. If I was to have a financial product and yes. claim that the historic returns were a thousand percent per year when they were not, then you'd be prosecuted for that. But there are much more subtle forms of misinformation, such as hiding contradictory evidence, which is really difficult to prosecute. And so the reader needs to be on his or her guard. And that's what my book is about. The more subtle forms of misinformation that we are really susceptible to, because these are things that can never be regulated or legislated. I love that. And I keep going back to that 10,000 hours with Malcolm Gladwell. It almost sounds the same thing. You talked about like, yeah, this may be true, but with, the, with Simon Sinek, you didn't really tell the whole truth. It's the same with the violinist. It's just like, you didn't say it was just about the violinist. So it can't apply to everything else. Alex, of course, you are now teaching us that the, oh wait, earlier I, I just remembered, you talk about integrity, which is a, a way to kind of navigate this this misuse or misinformation, but Alex, how do we navigate the truth if we can't trust people to be in integrity? 
there's a couple of things that we can do. Number one is we could try to stand on the shoulders of giants and look at people and rely on other people to do the checks uh, for us. So there is an academic peer review process. So for what for me to publish my papers on purpose and profit in a top academic journal, it needs to be scrutinized by some of the world's leading experts. So they want to make sure that the methodology is absolutely accurate. No claims are made without them being fully supported. Now, I know that peer review has its flaws and there are people who write about it not being perfect. But to be honest, a lot of people who make write these articles, they have never published a peer review pa um, paper in their life. They never yes. have any experience of the peer review process. And these I things see. are taken really seriously. So I have somebody who has to always go through peer review. And I have been on the other side, the managing editor of an academic journal for six years. I know how very carefully people take this uh, job. Now, this doesn't mean it's perfect. Right? Because even if the process is there, you're, it's not that you're never going to be making a mistake. Just like even if a doctor is really at the top of the game, it might be they're not able to, sell, sell to, to save every single patient. But perfect should not be the enemy of good. One thing we want yes. to look at is, is this peer reviewed? Because if not, then you have people like Simon Sinek who put out their ideas all the time, which have never been checked or verified by anybody. But the by second anybody. Thing, no, by, by, by anybody, because like if you publish a book, right, no, nobody needs to check, check that. The publisher might do, but the publisher's goal is to publish what sells, not what is actually scientifically accurate. In contrast to an academic journal, where the mission is to make sure that only accurate stuff is being published. But the second thing to do, because you can't exclusively rely on whether something is peer reviewed, is to do the checks yourself. And so what I do in the book is I come up with a simple practical list of questions that people can ask themselves to see, well, how much they can trust a statement. And notice that these are simple questions. They don't require anybody to have a large scientific background. These are just simple things to check. And one thing we mentioned earlier is what was the context in which the data was originally gathered. If you just see that the study was in violin playing, it might not apply to other things like neurosurgery and chess, there you only need to read English. You don't need to do statistical pyrotechnics to ask that question. I love that. First of all, peer reviews might not be perfect, but quite literally probably the best system that is right that, that we have right now of any form of deep fact checking or deep research or keeping our researchers accountable. Why not trust peer reviews if it's the best thing that we possibly have right now? There might be room for, for thought to improve. Like you said, not perfect, but it's there, you know, and like standing on giants. Let's try to, to trust what they have. It's just that it's right now it's too, it's, it's too, it feels like it's too much to ask for people to even trust the scientists, to even trust the really, you know, the more trustful sources of all of that. Again, this is just, it's, it's a massive, I want to call it a clusterfuck, so to speak, right? It's a massive misuse of data, misinformation, people just believing anything left and right based on their biases. I understand that these are one of the things you teach. Alex, you talk about the ladder of misinference, if I pronounce that right. The ladder of misinference. What is this ladder of misinference? And how can it help us climb out of the misinformation abyss? So the ladder of misinference is a practical tool to spot misinformation. So before I wrote my book, I read other books on misinformation. And that they were good. I'm not going to criticize them because I view them as rival books. They were good. They were comprehensive. In fact, they were so comprehensive that sometimes they were hard to put into practice. They would identify the 259 ways in which people can fall for misinformation. And it's hard to remember all 259 and to put them into practice. So what I do in the ladder of misinformation is I categorize misinformation into just four buckets. And why I use this ladder is that when you start from some facts and you draw inferences from them, you are climbing up the ladder. But I call this the ladder of misinference because sometimes you make incorrect inferences from certain states. So let me start with the first step. So the first misstep is a statement is not fact because it may not be accurate. So we like to quote people all the time. For example, uh, one famous business quote is culture eats strategy for breakfast, a quote attributed to Peter Drucker, a famous management guru. And people use this as proof 
that culture really matters because Peter Drucker said so. But there's problems with that. First, Peter Drucker never said it. So often people are attributed with quotes that they never said. And number two, so even if Peter Drucker did say it, it's a quote without any evidence behind it. Just because a famous person says Gosh. something, it doesn't mean it's true. We often have this halo effect where we'll believe anything an authority figure says, even if it's not actually backed by any data. Wow. Wow. And I love that. And how common is that, by the way, where you, where there's a statement that comes out and then we just, boom, we just believe it just because it's like a strong statement, right? And especially coming from someone. And for all we know, they, they never actually said it. And you, now again, there's so many things to navigate to the, the misinformation, disinformation that we're receiving today, Alex. Of course, I welcome our audience and listeners out there to go check out Alex's books. That is, first is the Grow the Pie. And the second is May Contain Lies. And of course, go check out his website, maycontainlies.com. Alex, it's, it's a world of untruth out there. The goal is to have people, you know, read more of your book, hopefully, and learn more how to navigate themselves around it. Alex, if there is one last thing that you could leave with us today and how we can navigate this world of misinformation, what would it be? It's actually the problem is simpler than we think. So when you think there's so much misinformation out there, AI might be producing misinformation, experts cannot be trusted, we might feel daunted. We think that this is really complicated. But what I wanted to highlight is we actually have some simple tools that we can do. We don't need new statistical training. We just are trying to harness the simple, the discernment that we already have. And that's why I wrote my book. There's not a single equation in the entire book. All the questions and missteps and, um, that we make are, are simple to understand. So while this might seem daunting, actually it's the opposite. These are things just asking a few questions, a little mindset shift, this can have a huge difference on the decisions we make and the information that we make. Love that discernment i think it's all innate in all of us and just a little bit of patience just i think really what i always say is just read you know like read a little bit more and then dig into it a little bit more and of course i invite our audience and listeners to go check out alex's book again read that one read his book may contain lies alex where else can we find you where else can we connect with you I'm on LinkedIn and X at A Edmans, A E D M A N S. So I try to write a lot of stuff for a practitioner, general audience, not just an academic audience. And often this work I share is not my own work, but work by other people that I think is interesting um, in this field. I'm trying to make um, complex concepts understandable and clear for a general Alex, you're fantastic. I mean, this is all very clear and very simple for, again, for all the audience and listeners out there. I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as well. I hope you guys take away a lot of truth from this. And Alex, I thank you for being such a beacon of, you know, of, of clarity and truthfulness and you know, just learning all of that in the world of uh, disarray right now. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Joshua. I really enjoyed the conversation. Fantastic. To all our audience listeners out there, once again, go get grab a copy of Alex's book. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode and we will see you on the next one. Bye-bye. All right. So here's the thing. We try to get a little bit better every day, but we can't do it without you. So if you like the video, make sure to like and subscribe below. And if you have any comments, just leave them in the space under.